I welcome you all for the first panel discussion for this conference. I, I think we can. We uh, I'm dying to hear each of you with your wonderful thoughts there. So okay. Um. Uh, so since the topic is licensing uh, in crisis, and we want to focus on what brands actually are doing, um, you know, under these circumstances, uh, I think the way. So I think um, uh, what we wanted to then achieve through this wonderful panel is each of you is an expert uh, of uh, your domain, and um, what we want to bring to the audience is your thoughts on uh, a. uh you know uh, in general uh you know how you've seen the shift in some of those licensing trends practices and policies and we will then touch upon um in these two buckets one is what we are seeing companies organization and in house councils do uh with respect to that i'll i'll sort of bring in satish your comments hither you can talk about what startups are focusing on and so on and so forth and then uh, what are the changes that we see executed through documentation where i'll bring in ismail your comments and then of course a critical part would be all of this has it also brought in some changes on the practice side whether it is on how you advise your customers how you advise your clients or on the other hand how you see your clients sort of preferring certain mechanisms over others in the keynote session i heard a lot about um, a med art med or dispute resolution and alternative dispute resolution mechanism so do you think those are now even more preferred than uh, you know let's say litigation or the standard uh, cease and desist notices and injunctions and so on and so forth and is there a certain trend that you're noticing with respect to how orders are being passed Uh, are are the courts or the judiciary looking at these things differently now because of the circumstances around all of this so without much ado on that uh, this is the general structure and flow for the session that we're going to follow and uh, uh, satish i'll straight away start with you and i will bring in your thoughts here and i will want you to tell us all about how is it and and you know uh, you come from a software domain so how is it that you see your company whether it is ramco or some other companies your competitors your partners your suppliers are managing this licensing in crisis uh, are you looking at things differently uh, are you addressing force measures differently now uh, is is there a certain view you are taking on termination clauses consequences of terminations and so on and so forth but in general uh, you know if you could give us a brief overview of how this has changed things for Uh, business in general uh, thank, uh, you, thank you thank you lakshika and, and uh, uh, good morning, morning to everyone, everyone. Uh, this is uh, a very, very good, good topic, topic uh, on licensing uh, during uh, crisis uh, circumstances and uh, we are a product company so um, we do license uh, at both uh, pre um, crisis post crisis and during the crisis and uh, how we manage or how does you know mostly software companies manage is something that we uh, will see uh, so on two aspect one is when we are as a, a licensor and uh, the other aspect that we will be seeing is once uh, we are as a uh, no as a customer so first you know i will see i'll uh, uh, discuss about what uh, we did uh, during as a licensor during the time of crisis as a licensor usually this is a very testing time and um, uh, you know we see a lot of customers invoking force major clauses and lot of customer going for termination lot of customers uh, going for uh, you know suspension of uh, uh, the services so how did we manage uh, all this you know first is uh, force major it it has to be seen that you know we have to go with respect to the force major clause in the agreement so it has to be black and uh, white you know it has to be given very clearly in the agreement if customer is invoking a force major clause then we have to see how soon can he uh, you know invoke the force major clause uh, it is not that you know after a crisis after one month or two month he invokes the force major clause once he realizes that he is not able to pay so usually as soon as the force major event has occurred or as soon as you identify the crisis as a force major event that is very important you have various types of crisis so if a crisis happens 
and you identify that to be a forced major event then immediately i don't know what is there in your document or if nothing is mentioned preferably within a reasonable time is what we uh, say within a reasonable time uh, one has to invoke the force major you cannot entertain as uh, a licensor i cannot entertain force major uh, event that has happened that is invoked by a customer after say uh, 20 days after one month or whenever they feel that um, no this is the best recourse to uh, you know stagger the payment or stop the payment you know whatever they feel so uh, you have to be very careful when a customer invokes you have to see as per the contract there is no one set which uh, which will rule all the scenarios so go go as per the contract if the customer has invoked the force major event at the right time then you don't you may not have an option if you feel that uh, the crisis is a typical force major event accept that and uh, see that you know it you also during the force major event whether you have option for termination where if the force major event persists for if the crisis event persists for a longer time whether you have option to terminate or whether the payment obligation sometimes it so happens that uh, you know the payment obligations are outside the force major event so ensure that your uh, payment uh, is continued even during the crisis so this is some these are some of the important points that i will suggest that uh, which you should take care of in the force major event and the other aspect that i would like to uh, you know briefly touch upon here is termination and post termination as uh, uh, lakshika had highlighted so the customer may you know at their convenience also feel that because of the change in the business scenario because it's a supply chain down the line you know their customers have terminated they in turn want to terminate the agreement with us so go through the agreement again you know it's all the agreement that speaks you know documents which have not been used for a long time and now we will speak because you see whether the customer has a right to terminate the agreement under what circumstances it is if it is a right for uh, termination for convenience or termination for breach if it is a termination for convenience then uh, you have to ensure that you know whatever the period uh, for notice period is there whether it is 45 days or 60 days or whatever period is given if they comply with that and if it is termination for breach you may have sometimes need to contest it because you know they may be you know disguising uh, the some other facts as a uh, breach event and trying to terminate the agreement so these are some of the uh, important points that you need to see and uh, again during licensing during the crisis the other important aspect is once the uh, termination event has happened you have to ensure that all the payments are accrued till the date of termination you should have a right to claim for all payments that have accrued till the date of termination and you should not miss that opportunity this should have been there in the contract Uh, otherwise you know we should take this into a uh, note that you know even then when there is licensing happens uh, during um, uh, termination you should be very careful that all the accrued payments you are able to recover from the customer so uh, that these are some of the points that i can uh, highlight lakshika so satish if i can ask you to very briefly uh, tell me one uh, challenge as a licensor which has irked you the most during uh, the, the crisis uh, and how did you manage that just one uh, top of your mind and you the most points yeah uh, thanks lakshika so the most most critical factor is the payment you know if, uh, i have been following up on the payment uh, portion uh, during crisis is uh, during crisis none of the customers is ready to pay so you need to send legal notices you need to follow up and uh, you should exercise suspension right uh, before you ultimately uh, pick up your uh, ultimate weapon of termination of the agreement so uh, this are some uh, payment uh, obligation or getting payment from the customer is one of the biggest challenge that i face as a licensor i think that's very helpful so uh, thanks satish i may circle back to you if time permits later on and ask you about one of the Uh, uh benefits also but for for now i'll move on to heather and because satish mentioned that payment is one of the biggest thing that irked them during this while and it's dip- becoming difficult to get customers to pay up 
uh, and he did talk a lot about termination and consequences and how to then recover those payments heather because you work a lot with startups and you have that interaction uh, you know with companies that are still uh, small or medium sized enterprises i would like to understand from you how do you see this has changed the way they do business uh, what is it that they really want do they really want to do the licensing agreements the way they used to do uh, is there a situation you see for those smaller enterprises which can ever be a win win uh you know because uh, if uh, and, and and anything else that you can share uh, in terms of your experience of working from uh, a startup perspective yeah i yeah, mean absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's that's a that's great, great question. question and i and think, I think that, that, uh, something uh, something that something that arises that very, very frequently, frequently is whether, is whether or, not or not companies, companies are still are even looking oh i think there's like a little echo yeah. okay yeah is this sort of whether or not companies are even still looking to enter into license agreements you know during this time of covid and you know i think that there are certainly uh you know especially startups constantly seeking ways to create those sort of win-win scenarios and i think that through these different license agreements you know parties can create those win-win scenarios um really by granting that license permission to use that ip in certain instances and on certain basis and terms uh, of the licensor and so i think when you look at it there's a lot of benefits not only to the licensor but also to the licensee and both of those aspects and benefits are are pretty instrumental so we see that even with the licensors you know it really creates a great opportunity for them to enter into new markets enter into geographic regions that they otherwise maybe wouldn't have um had the ability to without you know substantial uh work uh, but i think also licensors have the benefit of really being able to license their ip outside of the main business focus and um even with licensees you know getting to implement business strategies and developing new products and services without them having to personally undergo a lot of the work and and engage in the research and and use of resources that the licensor may have already done um to obtain the ip really in the first instance and so i think that in itself um is really beneficial to allow licensees to increase their their profit margins in that way um and then i think even from that you know it's it's also looking at how um startups are kind of looking at drafting an ip license agreement and kind of assessing some of those risks that are associated with just you know doing business on a day-to-day -day basis and i think that that helps us to kind of look a little bit more on how we can help our clients to ensure that their license agreements are actually you know reaching the full potential reaching that sort of market value that they're really looking for and um even as satish had mentioned you know a well crafted license agreement it includes so many things but it's really a, a commercialization strategy and can serve as like an additional source of revenue for a lot of these um startup business businesses in this kind of industry and i think that you know especially with license agreements they they really just set the boundary of the relationship so i mean they're long term relationships so you know in entering these different agreements both sides have to be very flexible and and understanding through the negotiation process really just to not only build a relationship but also to maintain it and and monitor that relationship so that it can continue to flourish uh in the years to come and i think really that license agreement is just the first step so there there i think some good points and uh, you you do uh, sort of agree then with also what satish mentioned on construct of these license agreement becomes extremely important it's critical to see what goes into that documentation because ultimately in an event of crisis that's what you're going to bank upon and if that's not crafted well i think uh, uh, it's almost an attack on your backbone uh, which which you don't realize unless you actually break it so um uh, so uh, uh, with, with that note and either i'm going to come back to you later uh, with some of my own queries on that but uh, for now i'm going to move on to ismail and ismail uh, you know because we we know and and we have a general consensus in the panel that uh, the agreement construct in itself is extremely important what are some of those critical points you would like to suggest uh, not just as the licensor but also as the licensee of that technology or brand or trademark or that ip per se um you know which should go into the contract uh, whether it is uh, of course we touched upon termination consequences force measure but certain other things such as um, you know perhaps reps and warranties the indemnifications around it and so on and also uh, also uh, i mean in india it is still nascent but 
a lot of brands across the globe are are using their ip in these moments of crisis as an additional source of revenue uh, you know uh, there there may be a trademark or there may be a certain ip perhaps a, a business goodwill lying somewhere which they never thought about but now they're getting creative in terms of uh, uh, you know modes of revenue and in terms of ch- channelizing that to get some more monies out of it so would you like to also touch upon that and give us uh, some highlights and share experiences on how some brands are innovating on that front yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. thank you lakshika so uh, my contribution here will be to present some practical tips like to set some considerations and uh, pitfalls regarding more the financial side of licensing so with different issues i've seen lately so from the licensor side how to make sure that the money keeps coming in and from the licensee side, how to avoid being trapped in agreements that will put too much financial pressure on your shoulders. So it's all about mitigating the financial risk. And like to say, the first point I'd like to bring is the trademark security interest. So in other words, is the, uh, you know, when you put up a trademark as a collateral to secure financing. For me, I realized that it is uh, still an underutilized tool. And especially with SMEs, because where cash flow issues might uh, arise and when licensors can experience revenue shortfalls in those times of crisis. And uh, now it could be more difficult than ever to uh, obtain securization backed by trademark licensing revenue and the uncertainty on the revenue stream. So the, what I've seen is the financial institutions uh, might be not open to take a security interest in the proceed licensures might receive from royalties. So uh, that being said, the licensor's trademark remain a highly valuable set. It's the, the value of goodwill. And um, so I've seen in my practice within the, the past few months an increasing recourse to the trademark security by licensors. So to add access to additional cash flow and to uh, absorb losses. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I've noticed this tendency in the clothing industry and in the travel industry also. So not that, that surprising, maybe. Um, the, the key takeaway here is that uh, for me, trademark rights are still today an untapped source of collateral. And uh, licensors could consider tapping additional sources of funding through security interest. And you know, keeping in mind that security interests will not affect as such, the licensee uh, ability to benefit from the license rights. Uh, the second point is um, including the most favored nation clothes. So the COVID-19 pandemic served to highlight the importance of including such clothes, uh, especially in non-exclusive licenses. So as this type of clothes protects again against the risk that the uh, IP owner might grant a uh, subsequent licensee uh, license with a significant lower uh, royalty rate or other more favorable terms. And so if you do not have this clause in your agreement, that could constitute, constitute sorry, a substantial threat to any licensee from a competitive standpoint. Uh, you can imagine a competitor with a lower uh, royalty cost, right? may damage the licensee's business by eroding its sales volume prices for the licensed product. And um, it is a good transition for my uh, next point, which is the uh, a good practice to establish, uh, at least in Canada, you can do it, what is called the minimum advertised price policy for the licensed product. So the, the point here will be to impose restrictions on the price at which a product or a service may be advertised by the licensee. So uh, as a licensor can be concerned that they are losing control over the brand and the uh, advertising of the product, um, you obviously you, you don't want to see a premium branded product be discounted uh, to the point of being considered cheap. And today, in those times of crisis, as the financial margin you know, as, or squeezed, uh, it's, it's instituting such uh, minimum advertising policies it can be an effective tool you know, in decreasing discounting and prevent the margin erosions for licensors. And uh, 
Uh, last point would be the uh, brand promotion and cooperative advertising, what we also call the co-op advertising in the licensing agreements. Uh, those types of provision, you know, it's where licensees agree to support the product through advertising efforts and commit to the payment of all co-op marketing fees in the territory. And where such a clause is included, uh, it can be a cost-effective way for licensors to reach their target markets. And so, so it is very important here for licensors to make sure that uh, licensees will put their shoulders to the wheel so that the brand can maintain its strong presence in the marketplace during those times. Uh, otherwise, the licensee could be inclined to do you know, minimum effort and cut on expenses. Uh, sure, so yeah, this sure. is it for me. I, I think uh, those are some very good points and uh, you, you uh, talked about uh, most favored nation. I mean, at some point, Satish, I would like to hear your views on that because as a licensor, sometimes these become very difficult to sort of negotiate and also execute. And um, uh, uh, just because, you know, some uh, licensee is pushing to be the most favored customer, uh, I'm not even sure how most of the licensors see it because it does put an additional burden on the entire business if you have one such uh, most favored customer uh, condition in one of your contracts. Uh, but again, uh, some very good points and, and those are interesting points from a licensee's perspective to have in the agreement. Uh, then you made a very interesting point around uh, securitization and using trademarks or your IP, registered IP for that purpose as an additional revenue stream. Uh, uh, which, uh, which brings me to a very interesting situation we've had in India and especially in the Indian Supreme Court and, and we've seen some of the very well-known brands that uh, you know were used to obtain loan against and then the company went bankrupt and so on and so forth. So um, can I request uh, uh, you know your views Napinai on um, uh, that front first and then we can move on to discuss uh, other licensing trends and uh, judicial orders that you're looking at or perhaps watching and uh, highlight for us how that has changed. But first, I would like you to opine on that uh, trademark being used to secure either loans or as an additional revenue stream. Uh, yeah, uh, how, how are Indian courts seeing it? And I'm not even sure if they're still open to that thought because uh, uh, we've been scathed and we've seen that uh, we've been burned in the past, so I, I really don't know if banks are still willing to look at those options. Thank, Thank you. you. Those are very interesting thoughts that everybody has shared. Let me try and bring all of the litigation perspective. Uh, firstly, I know you want me to address the trademark monetization aspect. I'm going to come to that last. But the first thing uh, that Satish had highlighted about the force majeure clause and the uh, discussion on the chat box too, you're absolutely right. And this takes me back to my early days when we used to have to tell people about why a copy paste is not a good thing. There are no such thing as formats. There are no such thing as uh, templates, you know. So here, this COVID pandemic kind of like brought to the fore why you shouldn't just use a generic, uh, uh, you know, template uh, kind of contract. And you will see the importance of that when it particularly comes to the stage of enforcement, where each and every word and comma are going to have a bearing in terms of how it is going to be implemented. So the first thought I wanted to share was, when we are talking about force measure, you'll have to look at the holistic aspect of it and not just look for words specific to an issue. I think what Satish had clarified in the chat also is it's not about providing a force measure for COVID. I think uh, Lakshika has some problem with at her end. Some technical glitch. So uh, in the meanwhile, Satish, can I get your views on that uh, uh, MFC, um, you know, sort of provision that Ismail talked of earlier? 
and how do you see those provisions work for you as a licensor uh, do you think those are reasonable and to what extent see uh, my, my take on uh, uh, having, having it uh, uh, is most, most favorite, favorite customer, customer we should not accept, accept and, uh, and uh, because, because that is creating lot of problem and they try to benchmark, benchmark and, and they, they subsequently they also, also have, have customer also try to have a audit clause um, you know but um, with uh, once you give a most favored uh, you know clause then the customer try to benchmark uh, the more mfc clause with respect to other uh, you know uh, clients it becomes a very tiresome uh, problem once uh, this have because you know uh, the mfc cannot be given to any customer uh, you know per se because this will also be a restrictive in our nature the business scenario depends from time to time you know the business scenario that we are facing uh, during crisis may not be the same when we face the same when we get the same business opportunity post the crisis so you know i have a feeling that the mfc clause uh, at whatever time it is you know has to be resisted and this uh, this is a lot of pain areas because of uh, multiple reasons and if they if at all you agree to that i know you should ensure because sometimes i see if it is a big brother client uh, you know you don't have an option to uh, you know negotiate you uh, know it is like uh, take it or leave it you know that is the scenario that you usually face in those scenarios i i will say try to insert a clause mfc clause will only be applicable uh, with a with a disclaimer you have to put saying that for same type of business same condition same uh, business volume so that you know you have some way to uh, escape if at all you know that you are cornered at some point of time in future so uh, I, i think uh, this is my take uh, as far as the mfc clause is concerned um, uh, which you have to take keep in mind while drafting contracts that's the most important that's what uh, we attorneys are being paid for so those are helpful inputs uh, in fact heather that brings me to you because uh, recently and especially now with the crisis i'm seeing that a lot of the smaller enterprises and startups are becoming over aggressive when they are negotiating these licensing arrangements and uh, i'm using the term over aggressive because i think they're pre- trying to sort of protect their interests but uh, a, a, a lot of times i'm seeing that the uh practitioners or lawyers or attorneys advising them are over protecting to the extent that it is becoming a hindrance to the business so j- just for example you know they're sort of disclaiming all warranties on their products they're disclaiming um uh, standing behind their product in terms of not being able to give indemnifications if if there is any ipr breach and so on and so forth so uh, how do you see this is this a trend Am because of Yes, Napani, you are. Uh, I just posed a question to Heather. Maybe I'll circle back. Because I have completely lost connectivity in the middle. Wachika, may I continue? I don't know how far. far. I just posed a question to Heather. If if you don't mind, we'll circle back on where you left. Uh, you know, for continuity. Yeah, yeah, but I actually don't know where I left. No, that's okay. So um, I, I just posed a question to Heather. I'll let her answer that, and then we'll circle back. In the meanwhile, you'll you'll be able to for, sort of uh, gather where you left, and I'll I'll point that out to you when I come back. Sure, sure. and and you know I think exactly what you mentioned is is that there are so many key provisions in all of these license agreements, and Satish already talked on um, touched on a couple of them, especially the. considering the term and termination as well as the cost and compensation and i think even especially with a lot of these startups they're putting a lot of emphasis on what exactly are the actual grants and the rights that are included in this license and i think for them um they're really focusing on you know how do we determine for our business you know what's going to be distributed what kind of adaptations can actually take part or or be worked with in terms of our our particular IP that we're either licensing or if we're the lic- um the licensee of um and what kind of opportunities might there be for reproduction and so a lot of it is trying to find a balance in in discussing some of these big you know provisions around the license grant itself and determining whether or not that license might be exclusive or non-exclusive and if there might be territorial rights around that as to you know having that agreement be focused more so on an international basis or just you know more local or national regional basis um and so i think of course in considering your you know limitations of liability and your reps and warranties um you know also placing a lot of emphasis on those license grants uh, at the very onset of the conversation for a lot of these startups 
Sir, uh, so um, I'm going to now circle back to uh, Napinai, to you. And uh, what we were discussing was some of the uh, things that you're seeing during this crisis uh, sprout up uh, during negotiation on the licensing agreements. And you were highlighting the key uh, focus areas. Uh, uh, of course, Satish, Ismail and Heather have mentioned a few. Uh, but, you know, we would like to hear from you what are those things we should focus on and how these impact actually at an execution level. What you've written today into that document is going to uh, come back to you when you actually run into a dispute. Thank you, Lakshika. And I'm sorry, I, my uh, screen just froze. So very, very quickly. One, as I had already pointed out, don't rely on template uh, documentation. It's very important that you apply your mind to what you put into your agreement because that's what is going to hold you instead if it goes to litigation. Even if it doesn't go to litigation, let's assume you're even at a mediation stage as was pointed out earlier and you need to uh, highlight what are the strengths or weaknesses of your case. You want to point out what exactly was intended when parties got into the uh, transaction you have to go to the written word and therefore it's very important that you uh, lend focus to what you uh, put into an agreement. The second aspect which I was highlighting and probably when I got lost was this issue of looking at it from both perspectives and how courts look at an agreement. Be it force majeure or any other provision, the standard uh, approach of courts is to ensure that the contract is implemented they would be very reluctant to strike down a contract. You know, upholding the contract would be the norm. Striking down something or allowing a party to exit would be the uh, alternative uh, remedy. So for you to sustain an exit, for you to sustain your claim even of force measure, you need very precise clauses which will support your claim. So on this, I was also pointing out the reverse aspect which Lakshika had pointed out earlier from a licensee's perspective. So for instance, look at a situation where a licensor may go bankrupt. In that case, what happens, let's say an ERP software which a licensee may have taken and they need to have continuity in terms of usage of that software and the licensor going bankrupt should not necessarily impact the rights of the licensee. Here again, the golden standard of courts ensuring that license agreements will be enforced. Any kind of contracts will be enforced and will seek performance comes into play and it will help the licensee in a situation like this. We do have provisions of doctrines of frustration where parties in these kind of situations can claim why the contract cannot be performed. Let's take, for example, minimum guarantees, right? So Satish spoke about the difficulty in terms of recovering payments, in terms of granting license rights. Look at the reverse side of it, where a licensee may not be able to meet minimum guarantees because certain situations which were not envisaged have come up. So you have one aspect of taking force measure, etc. into play. But you also have the doctrine of frustration. So you need to look at contractual terms holistically. How have the trends been in terms of court processes? The very first thing which I've noted in terms of even a preliminary stage of a dispute is a reluctance to go to court and rightly so. Because this in the best of times, parties are very, very reluctant to go to court. We always try and seek a meeting or a uh, not necessarily a court enabled mediation, but a conciliatory process where we would try to resolve issues in an easy manner and without having to litigate on it. But we have seen situations now in terms of even understanding what is urgent and will the courts come down heavily on a litigant because they took a litigation to court, which the court then decides is not urgent. So the uncertainty in terms of how a court will view what is an urgent litigation, will they entertain ad interim and in India, in terms of civil disputes, your remedies start and end with interim reliefs. So if you haven't got your interim reliefs, in effect, the entire case may become uh, uh, infructuous by the time it's decided and it just becomes a periquetry later on. 
So therefore, how a court would react at the stage when you're seeking interim or ad interim release becomes the most important thing to weigh in terms of going before a court. Similarly, even for arbitrations, COVID times has posed a lot of um, uh, limitations, but, but they, they have, have been the preferred alternative as opposed to litigation. So these are just some thoughts I wanted to share as a preliminary statement in saying, one, look at your contract, see what it applies for, provide for a pre-litigation uh, uh, negotiation process and complete that step. Don't rush to court unless there is something like a threat of immediate termination of a license or uh, a contract which will impact you negatively. Otherwise, exhaust your remedies under the contract, including of mediation or conciliatory talks, and then evaluate what is it that you need to rush to court for. And whilst doing so, understand that today, apart from the general backlog issue, the courts are also struggling with the very limited uh, uh, capability in terms of uh, video conference facilities. Every time there has been an attempt to start physical uh, hearings, we have faced trouble. In virtual hearings, we have seen some minor uh, glitches in terms of connectivity and being heard clearly, etc. But to a large extent, virtual hearings have been very, very effective. And it has come in very handy, particularly for urgent uh, hearings. And again, the last bit to reiterate what I was mentioning earlier, urgent becomes a very subjective issue. And I would require, I, my hope rather or uh, faith would be the courts would be a little benevolent in terms of uh, interpreting it, particularly when it comes to imposing cause, because they cannot impose cause merely because a litigant believes their particular case is urgent or not. Uh, deterrence uh, in terms of, uh, you know, better usage of uh, limited facilities is understandable, but it should not be at the cost of losing the trust factor from litigants. Over to you, Lakshmi. So much. So uh, uh, all in all, what I hear from uh, the panelists here is that devil lies in the detail. And I think unless we've got that right, uh, we're, we're, we're anyways headed towards disputes, conflicts. And at that point in time, uh, we'll realize that it will be so much easier to resolve those if we've been careful about what those details are. But having said that, um, I, I'm going to do a quick uh, sort of um, round here with each of you, giving me one uh, one specific advantage or benefit you've foreseen or you foresee or you've already experienced during this crisis uh, which adds to sort of the way we do licensing uh, and just be very quick because I, I, the organizers are telling me that we've got only about four minutes or so to wrap up this session so uh, I'll start with Ismail you uh, if you can highlight with that one point and then we'll move on to Heather Satish and again back to you Napinai, uh, uh, that's where how we'll conclude this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Like, thank you. So for me, it's really about the collaborative approach. So conciliatory approach. Do not try to pull the cover. Try to you know have an open and honest discussion about the um, license relationship because you have, well, obviously you have the you know the um, clauses in the contract. But if you look. If you take a step back, you have people behind the, the, the contract. So being um, able to uh, discuss about the contract, the clauses, and uh, being more you know, collaborative because uh, in, everybody is on the, the same boat. And uh, so as well for, uh, for licensors and licensee, just to be more collaborative. So this is my thing. Well said. Thank you. People come first. Yes, I agree. Heather, any any particular points from you on that? Sure. You know, and I would really you know touch on the the aspect of working remotely as how it has helped to really build uh, continue to build a lot of our license relationships that we've been using with startups and their businesses. I think um, not only has it allowed for us to just work a lot more collaboratively and and be more connected to our clients, but even I think um, through reviewing the different agreements and working through those, it's allowed us to, us to really be more diligent in um, in sort of going through the different provisions that are that are really pertinent and important to our clients. And so I think that has uh, really helped us over the long term and will help us in the future to continue to minimize a lot of those risks um, that are associated with just the everyday 
um, doing business. So it's been sort of a blessing in disguise, actually, this crisis. So uh, thanks, uh, Heather. Uh, Satish, uh, what about your experience there? Uh, see, uh, I feel that, you know, whatever revenue that uh, we are losing, we need, should try to tap into new markets, uh, especially with new products, you know, for example, uh, facial recognition system. We came in with a new uh, product called the facial recognition system. You know, you uh, go with a, uh, for attendance without, uh, you know, the bio with, with the biometric solution, uh, which is touchless, you know. The, so, you know, that will take care of the revenue that you lost during the crisis. I think tap into new market, tap into new products, tap into new uh, segments of the business. And there you are floating uh, very smoothly. So it's it's made all of us even more creative and innovative. And I think that's created opportunities for businesses, for R&D and so on and so forth. So I totally agree with you there. Uh, again, we're circling back to you, Napinai. Uh, any thoughts there? Absolutely. And you're all right. There is always a silver lining to every problem. And what I have seen is a lot of innovation and indigenous initiative in terms of developing technology, which is, uh, you know, firstly, COVID moved us to the technology domain a lot faster than what was anticipated. Indigenous innovation and uh, uh, enterprise is much more visible in this domain. Uh, ideas or thoughts about an understanding of privacy and I'm particularly pointing this out considering Satish mentioned facial recognition technology. So understanding on thoughts of privacy and the very responsible use of technology has happened. And finally circling back to your point which unfortunately I didn't address in my the first session Lakshika on trademarks and monetizing the same. I would say the be uh, there is a much uh, better awareness in terms of the importance and the value of every kind of idea. People understand what is copyright and why they should not violate another person's rights. You know, even when you talk about, you know, today you have a, a populace which has been stuck indoors and yet piracy has come down. It is not like it has increased because they have other options, easier, less expensive alternatives, and also a better understanding of what piracy is all about. Similarly, when you're talking about trademarks and monetizing, we have always known trademarks are the most important and the most expensive of the IPs that could be monetized for a long period of time. Today, the understanding is a lot better. It is only about understanding how valuations function and whether they can use it in terms of securitization that is evolving today. And I would say banks are not that far behind in understanding it because they've already been involved in the valuation aspects. So to a large extent, they are moving ahead fairly strongly. But the issue always will be is this ephemeral, the kind of uh, valuation and the kind of uh, understanding we have in terms of intellectual property rights? Is it sustainable or is it just transient and is going to die along with COVID? Which are, COVID, I hope, will die very fast, but not the understanding and the learnings that we have got from this period. So this is what I believe is what we are looking at in the future. So much there. So, uh, in short, uh, you know, the conclusion that I hear from the panel is that there is always a silver lining. Uh, any crisis you go through makes us learn a lot. It's been a blessing in disguise. We've learned to innovate. We are finding new ways to creatively uh, remodel our business structures and so on and so forth. So, I, I think all in all, uh, it's not just bad. Uh, there are many good things here, and hopefully, the, all of that good is going to stay, uh, you know even though sort of we fare over this crisis uh, as, as we go along. So with that, we wrap up this wonderful session. Thank you so much, panelists, for great insights from each of you. I learned a lot today. I'll hand over now to the organizers. And if there are any questions or uh, however you would like to take it forward, we are here to uh, sort of address those. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lakshika. Thank you, Lakshika, for moderating this wonderful session and a very interactive session for the first panel discussion. And thank you to the key panelists joining for the today's conference and making this you know, session a very memorable one. So can we have any questions from the participants who are listening to this session? 
So we can take one or two questions. So anyone would like to join in the video and to ask face to face question from the key panelists and the moderator available here. Any questions for them? I think in the meanwhile, we can have a screenshot that is, you know, a quick snapshot of us to, you know, take the memories along for this conference. So thank you so much. So thank you, Lakshika, for joining for this uh, wonderful session and moderating it. And thank you to all the key panelists for this interactive session. So we look forward for your participation for the whole day. So uh, participants, thank you for joining in this session and kindly Thank you so much and bye from here.